Good morning, everyone. It's so good to be together as the house of the Lord, and uh, it is good to be together not only to have our service recorded here, but also to have some people in the room, and just to be able to be um, both live and remotely gathered together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if you are here today with us, welcome, and for those of you who are watching, uh, we're so glad that you can join us as well. Just to note about that, we are having some different services right now for the next few weeks. We're, we're trying out what fits us best, but for right now we have a, a service, and when we're filming on Saturday mornings at 9, I invite you to come to that. Also on Saturday night at 7 o'clock, we are gathering out in the church parking lot for a worship service, and then on Sunday morning at 9 o'clock, we're also gathering outside for a worship service as well. And I know 9 is a little early, but that just keeps it so that the sun isn't blazing right on us. But we're trying to feel this out and see what works best, so we'll be evaluating and appreciate your feedback as we go along and as we move into the summer. As we start here today, just to, I want to make a, uh, want to invite us to worship, and as we come into worship, to hear a call to worship. As we read this scripture from Galatians chapter 2, it's the second part of verse 16, I want to allow it to draw us into celebration of our good and our great and our faithful God. And so this is Galatians chapter 2, the second part of verse 16. So we too have put our faith in Jesus Christ, that we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by observing the law. Because by observing the law, no one will be justified. Father, we ask that you would both fill us with your spirit to worship you, that you would fill our hearts with gladness, but we also, Lord God, ask that you would move from our minds all those things that are pressuring us throughout last week or things that we are finding ourselves already anticipating and maybe nervous about for the week to come. I thank you that you invite us to cast those things upon you because you care for us. And right now, Lord, I pray that you'd fill us with peace, that we might hear you and see you and know you and celebrate you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm going to ask if Anna will come up and she's going to lead us in singing this great hymn, Great is Thy Faithful.
know, as we sing those words, all that I have needed, thy hand is provided. I want to give you just a moment to reflect this past week on all that God has provided. It's very easy to remember and look out and think about what we don't have. But I want to invite you just to take a quiet moment to both reflect on what God has provided and to give Him thanks for it. prayer, we ask God for a number of different things we're encouraged to, for our daily bread, for protection, for forgiveness. And as you go through this time of reflecting, and as you do it tomorrow and the next day, I encourage you to look in all those different categories, not simply the physical things that we have. And in that line, there is a, a theme in Psalm number 103 that I want us to listen to. It says, Praise the Lord, O my soul, and all my inmost being, praise His holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all our sins and heals all our diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. If you haven't heard yet today, in Christ, your sins are are forgiven, and they have been replaced with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I want to take a moment just to walk over here, and I want to talk to the kids today, but I got a couple of props that I'm going to bring up on the stage, so just give me one second to do that. I want to show you two different chairs. This green comfy chair the ones we usually have when we're sitting in the gym, which is where we are right now, and then this metal chair, which is what we used to sit on, uh, and the kind of older chairs that we had here at the church. Now this past Friday, a number of us got together. Friday morning, we were outside in the parking lot, and we were having a time of prayer together, and we didn't bring the green chairs out, we had this, and I don't know if you can see this, uh, and how well you can see it, or my hand afterwards, but it's rusty. It's got paint all over it, and there's part of it you could say, oh, I don't want to sit in that. I want to sit in something really comfortable like this green chair. But when I was sitting there, I realized this one thing. I don't care what I'm sitting on right now. I'm just glad I'm sitting with these people who I haven't seen their faces in months. And we can come together to pray together face to face. We've been doing it on Zoom, which is kind of nice, but much better and much more fun to be together. But I was also thinking about heaven. If you've ever heard about heaven, sometimes people talk about it and they say, oh, there's streets of gold and there's this big pearly gate. And sometimes people think that's what makes heaven great. But let me do an experiment for all the kids there. I'm going to ask you a question and see if you can answer right to your parents. What kind of flooring do you have in your kitchen? Do you have carpet? Do you have tile? Do you have wood flooring? All right, I want you to tell whoever you're with what kind of flooring you have in your kitchen. Now, some of you might have known just like this. Some of you might not even know what it was. So one follow-up question. Do you, kids, do you care what kind of flooring you have in your I'm going to think probably not. And so too, heaven has streets of gold, but it doesn't really matter what the flooring is. 
The authors of the Bible and the different books of the Bible are just trying to explain to us how magnificent heaven is, but it's, that's not what makes heaven great. What makes heaven great, just like what made my prayer meeting on Friday with those other people great, is that there were other people there, and we were together. And what makes heaven great is that we will be there together with our Creator and with our Savior. It's not about the stuff our feet are on. It's about the one that we're walking with, Jesus Christ, our Savior. And sometimes we can kind of forget that and we can get really concerned about what we're sitting in. And, and maybe one of the benefits of having been separated for a while is we remember that the greatest sitting is who we're sitting with rather than what we're sitting on. So I hope you're having a great week. And uh, for those of you who finished up school, congratulations. And I hope you have a really wonderful summer. I look forward to seeing you real, real soon. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up, and they're going to continue to lead us and praises to our God. Good morning, everyone. It is so good to be here this morning. Let's continue to worship the song.
Well, if you were together with us last week, I was introducing this wonderful, wonderful church. A church that had some very real problems, though, especially in regards to loving one another. And the church is started, and we can read about the start in Acts chapter 18, and that's what we were looking at last week. It's the church of Corinth, which is in southern Greece. The Apostle Paul goes there in Acts chapter 18, he preaches the gospel, he plants a church, but then, over the next five, six, seven years, Paul visits that church a number of different times, and he also writes it a number of different letters. In fact, what we're going to study this summer, 1 Corinthians, is actually the second letter that we know that Paul wrote. And what we have in 2 Corinthians is most likely letter number 4. But I want to reference back to something first. In Matthew chapter 28, Jesus instructed his disciples. And he said to them, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And so that is what Paul had done, he preached, baptized, 
And it is what he is continually doing in the sense of teaching them to obey everything that he had commanded. So he is continuing to mentor, to disciple, to instruct them. And you might think to yourself, if you remember back to last week in Acts chapter 18, it says that Paul was there for 18 months. And you might think, didn't that, wasn't that enough time for him to tell them and teach them everything that they needed to know? And, and I would ask all the parents in the room who have adult children, if you stop being a parent at any time. I think the answer from what I can see around me is the answer is no. And Paul keeps on parenting. And it's both wonderful in its joys. And it is also sleepless night struggles. Worrying about them. Wondering, how do I tell them what they need to be told? And so we are going to look through 1 Corinthians. But I implore you and myself not to learn about them but rather to learn from them. You see, Paul wrote this letter to a very specific group of people at a very specific time, but for the last 2,000 years, the Holy Spirit has used these words to speak to the whole church in every generation. May he continue to do that as we study it as well. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, and we're going to start with verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. I'm going to read down today to verse 9. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and your brother Sosthenes, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank God for you, because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end, so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. Father God, I pray that again you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see, to learn not just about this book and this letter that was written 2,000 years ago, but that your spirit might teach and instruct, encourage, rebuke, correct, train us through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, just for fun, because there is something else I very much want to get into today. But did you notice who Paul says is writing this letter with him? He mentioned it in verse 1. There's a man named Sosthenes. And I want to ask you if that name sounds familiar to you. Now, we can't be 100% sure that it's the same person, but they have the same name, and so it's very possible, very likely even, that this is the same man that we found at the very end of last week. I was making a point right at the end of last week's sermon, because at the end of this section in, Luke, in Acts chapter 18, there is a man named Sosthenes, who is the ruler of the synagogue, and the last thing we see about him, he's laying on the floor bloodied because he had been beaten by his own people. If you remember, there was a former synagogue ruler named Crispus, who Paul had been preaching in the synagogue, and he was, the, the Jews raised up, and they kicked him out, and he said, fine, I'm going to go to the Gentiles. He walks across the street, and he starts preaching to the Gentiles, and the synagogue ruler, Crispus, leaves and goes with him. Then another man raises up to that position of honor named Sosthenes, and he is the head of those who is trying later to take Paul down. And so they bring Paul before the proconsul, that is, before the, the ruler of Corinth, in order to get Paul arrested, in order to get him thrown out of town. But God protects and defends Paul, and we might find ourselves rejoicing in the 
fact that Paul walks away free and the, the leader of the people trying to take him down actually ends up getting beat up. But I want you to notice the incredible display of the gospel that happened somewhere between Acts chapter 18 and 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And perhaps it went like this. Sosthenes, again, is lying on the floor, beaten and bloody, his own people walking out the door. They don't want to help him. But the church comes back in. Paul and the other believers care for this man. They love him, even though he hated them, perhaps. And that love transformed his heart, and he came to believe the good news of Jesus Christ. And now, four years later, he is here partnering with Paul and writing this letter with him. And I want us to see that that is the power of the gospel. Not only to transform a man's heart who was against Paul, and now he is serving with him, but also to know to transform the heart of every believer and to enable them to truly love their enemies as Jesus instructed us to do so. To welcome them even when they are rejected by their own. It's only four verses, pardon me, four words in verse one. And our brother Sosthenes. But it says so much about the redeeming and the incredible loving power of the gospel. But, like I mentioned, something else to get to. So back in the text. Verse 2. I'm going to read it for you, and I wonder if you can be as amazed as I am as I read this. To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord, now, it might not seem it right off the start, but that is an absolutely amazing beginning to this letter. And I'll explain to you why. Because Paul is about to point out a huge number of areas that this church and the people that make up this church are not living out the gospel. He's going to tell them and point out that they are dividing themselves into all these little subgroups, and each group is arguing over which one of them is better. This group is celebrating sin, and they're confused, thinking that they're doing the right thing. This group is suing each other every time they have a conflict. And they're also selfish-minded when they gather together, and they're prideful in their worship. And Paul is going to sort of systematically point out all these areas where they are not being Christ-like. In fact, if you jump ahead with me to chapter 3, if you have your Bibles, you go to chapter 3, that starts the way we might think the letter should start. Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you are not yet ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. You are still worldly. Maybe we would think that's how Paul would have started out this letter, since it's a letter primarily about him correcting them. But that's not how he starts. Instead, he starts in verse 2 by saying, to those who are sanctified in Christ. He doesn't say to those who are supposed to look sanctified, be sanctified, to those who are supposed to act sanctified. He rather declares to those of you who are sanctified. Now maybe that word is unfamiliar to you. The word sanctify or sanctified or even sanctification refers to being holy. And in a sense, it refers to that in, in moral purity, but also in the sense of holy as being set apart, being, being belonging to something else, namely to God who has bought us by his blood. But here, this is written as a wonderful, a wonderful declaration of what God has done to those who are sanctified. Sanctification is often found in conjunction with the word that sounds like it, justification. Now, justification is a legal term. It's a courtroom term. It refers to being not guilty because any crimes that they have committed have been paid for by somebody else. For us, as we talk about the gospel, 
that somebody else is Jesus. But in that, justification is a sort of a definitive, happened, it's in time, done accomplishment. You are not guilty. You're forgiven. The judge declares it, and it's true. It's in the books. Sanctification is often talked about as a process for those who have been declared not guilty, by which the Holy Spirit makes us to look more like the Jesus who set us free. So we are holy, but the Holy Spirit is also making us holy. And you can find that in this verse when it says, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy. But Paul uses this term in its broadest sense here. And he talks about it in, in a, a sort of a grammatical way of a, of a perfect participle, which means it, it happened and the results continue to be true. You were sanctified and you continue to be sanctified. Now theologically, again, Paul is using the widest sense of this word, which includes everything from conversion, faith, justification, and the life of good works. On a narrow sense, sanctification can refer simply to the good works, the process of which the Holy Spirit is causing me, helping me, enabling me to do the good works which God has called me and enables me to do. Now, I want to say, because I might have just lost you, that this is a really big deal. If you've ever been to a meeting, if you've ever gotten called by a boss saying, hey, I need to see you tomorrow at 3 o'clock, or, or if you're a student and the teacher said, hey, we need to meet together, and you know that that meeting is going to include them talking to you about something where you are underperforming. But they started out by saying, I just want to say some really positive things about you. And then they, boom, they hit you with all the negative things. And you know it's coming, so you hear, okay, the positive, the positive, when's it coming, when's it coming, when's it coming? It'd be like somebody, if I went to a meeting and they said, Roger, we just want to say that you dress pretty nice and you have, you have fairly good penmanship, but you stink at everything else. So I would hear those two things thinking, okay, what's the good thing? But I know the bad is coming. It almost comes across like that's what Paul's doing in 1 Corinthians. As if he's saying something nice about them and their performance. Hey, you're doing pretty good here and here, but boom, you stink at all these other things. Now, come on. But Paul doesn't start out saying anything about their performance. He doesn't say you've been acting in these areas. He rather declares to them who they are because of Jesus' performance. They are sanctified. They are holy. They are perfect in Christ. Notice again what the verse says. Verse 2, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus. If, they, if, if that weren't enough, you could jump to verse 4 and notice what it says. I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. Verse 5, for in him you have been enriched. Notice in all of those verses, the key is that little phrase, in Christ. The idea of in Christ refers to having faith in Him, living in Him, connected to Him. The Christian life came into existence because of being in Christ, and it continues because of that phrase as well. Jesus doesn't simply get the Christian life started and then we're on our own. We were dead in our transgressions and sins before Christ, and we would be dead in our transgressions and sins at any point apart from him along the way. In fact, one more time from Lenski, who says, the moment that this little preposition in is canceled, we cease to be sanctified in any way. But as heavy as that sounds, I should note that there's nothing negative in verse 2. It's pure positive. To those who are sanctified 
in Christ. There's no warning here. There is simply a declaration that this motley crew of believers, and we're going to get to all their motliness. I don't know if that's a word, but I just made it up. We're going to get to all their motliness throughout the next couple weeks. But to this group, this ragtag group, if you will, he begins by declaring that they are holy in Christ. And so are you, dear brothers and sisters. Not because of what we have done, but because of what He has done. Now that doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit doesn't have things that He wants to do in your life, or things that He wants to purify from your life. But what it does mean is that you're not making your way to perfection, and if you don't get there, too bad, you, you, you miss out. You, at the start, are perfect, and along the way are perfect, because when God sees you, He sees His Son, Jesus Christ, robed around you, Therefore, he sees perfection. And on top of that, listen to verse 7 through 9 again. If you have your Bibles, look what he says. He just keeps pouring on the goodness. Therefore, you don't lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly await for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. In this, we're the recipients. God is the one doing all the action here. God is the one doing the equipping, the strengthening, the guiding of us along the way. He's the one doing all the actions. We're the ones receiving all the blessings. And this motley crew is also told at the start of Paul's letter, Paul's letter, that at the end, meaning not the end of the letter, but the end of time, that they are going to stand blameless before Christ. As he's about to go through this letter where he tells them all these areas where they're not blameless, he actually starts the letter by saying, at the end of time, you are going to be blameless. Not because he's going to do a good enough work and he's, I know we're going to get there because you already are there. And there's this incredible, incredible truth. And every time we sing, there's a couple songs. There's a couple, for instance, the great hymn, The Solid Rock, it, it ends with these words. It says, When he shall come with trumpet sound, O may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, Faultless to stand before the throne. Now, I know that's not fair. People want to talk about fair in life. I know that's not fair. It is not fair that one day I will be before the throne of God faultless because I know my faults. But God doesn't see them. He sees Christ. And that's the gospel. Now, just in closing, if I can. What makes this even more interesting to me, I started as a call to worship by reading from Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. What makes this even more interesting is the way the book of Galatians starts. In that letter, Paul does not start out with anything nice to say, which is really interesting because in contrast, that was a group of people who were trying so hard to live the right way. And this Corinthian group is trying in some sense so hard to live selfishly. So why does he start out rosy to them and to the group that's trying so hard that he starts out aggressive? It's all because of two words. And I wonder if you can remember what they are. It's all because of that phrase, because the group in Galatia who was trying so hard was being encouraged to drift away from Christ. To trust themselves, to trust their obedience to the law. And Paul comes across and comes down so hard saying that if you leave Christ, if you do this by your own strength, you have nothing. But to this motley crew, this ragtag group that's stumbling along the way, he starts out by saying, you are sanctified. And in the end, you will stand before the throne blameless. The 
Corinthian believers were rascals. But they are perfect in Christ. And so are you. And if you're hearing this today, if you are in Christ, then you too are sanctified and called to be holy. In fact, can I read the end of verse 2 one more time? I'll read the whole verse. To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy, together with all those everywhere, and if I could add, every time, who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. You too, Paul says, are sanctified and called to be holy. So rejoice, dear Christian, in what is true for you what is true about you in Jesus Christ. Let the Holy Spirit do his work of making you holy, as we read here in this work. Making you look more like Christ, but always knowing that you are already dressed in Christ. So that when the Father looks on you, that's what he sees. Actually, that's who he sees. He sees Jesus. And that's amazing grace. Father, I thank you and praise you as we start this letter and we get into all the weeds of it and all the good learning that we can do from it, I pray that you would root us in this glorious truth that we are already, as believers in Christ, sanctified. Lord, I thank you that we are justified, but I thank you that you have already made us holy. You have already set us apart. But as we think about ourselves, Lord, we may be on our mind or thinking, oh, I know this about myself and this about myself. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would encourage us and lead us and guide us in growing to look more and more like Christ without ever losing the idea that you have already made us righteous in Christ. Lord, I pray that throughout this summer and this fall that you would grab hold of us and shape us to make us more and more your instruments as we learn from your word as it is written to this group of believers 2,000 years ago. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
myself, myself getting chills every time I read that because it is such an audacious thing to say. And I'm going to stand before the throne of God faultless because of what Jesus Christ did for me. And if you're wondering about well, all we've talked about this morning, hear this benediction as it declares it afresh and anew. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory and majesty and power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, both now and forevermore.